everybody. Oh my God, there's an echo. Um, how are you? I feel like we should be like have we have drums, bass, and guitars up here, right? Put on a concert. Um, delighted to be here with you at uh, Web Summit yet again. Congratulations, uh, Paddy and team, on an incredible story at scaling this conference. Now, I have with me a panel. My name is Mike Butcher. I'm the editor at large for TechCrunch, uh, a little blog you might know of. Um, and I have here Gillian Tans from Booking.com, Jose Neves from Farfetch, uh, Nicholas Brusson from Blabacar, and Carlos Modas from the European Union uh, on the science, research, and innovation. Let's kick us off. I mean, how, uh, how inadequate do you feel as a European entrepreneurs? Second best, correct, yes? Well, you know, I think it's interesting. I think it's the, the wrong question to ask, right? Uh, I, I think we keep comparing ourselves to the US and Silicon Valley uh, as European, and it's the wrong, the wrong framework, right? So if you think of, uh, of how Silicon Valley came about, it's a very centralized model in the US where you know, lots of tech is happening in Silicon Valley. It won't happen in Europe, right? If you think of Europe, it's fundamentally decentralized. And I would say almost like the power of Europe is that you have Berlin, you have Paris, you have London, you have Stockholm, and you have slightly different type of companies coming out of these cities, right? So they all get like a different flavor. Um, so I think the old comparison actually probably doesn't make sense to start with. But you famously not launched in the US yet. Is that because you're concerned about the enormous amount of competition there from no, Uber, actually, Lyft, etc.? So, so talking about blah, blah, car, no, actually it has nothing to do with competition because there is no blah, blah, car equivalent actually in the US, right? So if you, if you think of this, um, this long distance carpooling model, uh, it never took off in the US. And actually it's, a, it's an interesting point about uh, US versus Europe because in the early days of BlaBlaCar, when we described the business model, one of the first questions we asked actually from early investors was always like, who's doing that in the US? And the answer was, well, no one. Uh, and the next sentence was, ah, okay, it's probably not gonna work then. Uh, I think it has changed, right? So, so if I look at the last five years, uh, I mean, first, I think there is like a generational shift. So you see like lots of like young people, top graduates actually want to work for startups. That was not true five years ago. That was even less true when I came out of school, like in 99, 2000. So I think it has changed. Uh, so we have that, that, that shift. And even in terms of um, two things, right? In terms of investors investing into Europe, it has increased a lot. And regulators actually understand Europe actually a lot more today than five years or 10 years ago. I want to talk about regulation in international markets in a minute. But Gillian, I want to turn to you. Booking.com, I'm sure you're, you guys are mistaken for a US yeah. startup all the time. Yeah. Is that correct? No, well, not really. I mean, we're, we're a startup that grew out of Amsterdam. So we see ourselves as a European success, which turned into a global leader. We're the third largest e-commerce company in the world. And basically, we grew out of Europe. And I think if you compare it to the US, I mean, for startups, it's great to have a very big home market. And I know when we started in Holland, the home market was very small. The, the advantage was that, ha that we had to think very early on how to cross borders and how to work with translations, how to deal with different cultures. So that was the advantage, which in the end think what made booking what it is today. But if you have a big home market, it also has its advantages that you automatically have a large customer base which you can test and learn from. But um, booking.com, uh it's, it's, a, it's a fairly traditional business now at this point. How do you think you can innovate on what you're doing? Well, I wouldn't say it's a very traditional business. If you think about how fast innovation goes at booking, we do over a thousand experiments every day on customers. That's how fast booking still is innovating today. Almost half of our business is being booked through mobile devices. Um, we do lots of innovations in the whole travel experience, so to speak. I mean, we are a technology company at heart, so we innovate through technology. And since technology and techniques are constantly changing, also booking as a company, of course, and the, the service we deliver is changing. Um, turning to you, Jose, um, with Farfetch, what the model, the business model that you came up with originally, uh, this um, boutique uh, system uh, that served very much the high end of fashion, luxury markets and, and boutiques. Um, do you think you could have done that in the US or was there something particular about uh, the, uh, the business of fashion, I suppose, in Europe that allowed you to develop the business model? 
<coughs> I think I most probably would have failed if um, I had started in the US. Um, to give an idea, um, actually the UK is not our largest supply market. Our, our largest supply market is by far continental Europe, so France, Italy um, um, are, are much bigger than the UK in terms of supply. And, and we, by chance or by madness, we, we decided to start from the get-go with five countries from the supply side, Italians and French included, and that's what gave us traction. Um, still today, 33% 30, 30, of our business from the demand side is American, so they're our largest customers. Um, but from the supply side, it's only 10%. So 80% of the supply is coming from um, Europe, actually. Uh, so Europe, ha actually, in fashion, is uh, number one unquestionably. Um, you take companies like uh, net Vente Vente Privé invented the flash sale model, um, ASOS, they are all multi-billion market cap companies. Um, I don't see any equivalence in, in the US. So and they all I came out of Europe, actually. They all came all, uh, so all out of Europe. So um, well that's another one to chalk up, I suppose, isn't it? Well, out of interest right now, what are your biggest markets? Is it Asia, uh, Europe, or the US? Uh, from a demand point of view, the US is the largest market. So that's one third of our sales. And APEC um, is 26%, so Asia Pacific. Um, turning to the European side of things, I mean, you guys have just announced a, a big fund. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, wh why, why did you uh, launch? Um, so this, do you want to? Ex you can explain the fund, obviously, to everyone. Um, but why did you launch it now, and where? Why did you see this gap in the market? But go ahead and explain it for everyone. No, thank you very much. I, I think that one of the major challenges that we have in Europe is this journey in between starting a company, getting it to a scale-up level, and staying in Europe. We are here with uh, great people that were able to stay in Europe, but others that have created companies, they, in the middle of the journey, they have to go somewhere else. And they have to go somewhere else because, in average, the venture capital funds in Europe are much smaller than in the US, 60 million in Europe, compared to 120 million in the US. So our idea of launching these 1 billion plus fund of funds is to be able to fund bigger tickets. People that need to go up to 50 million, 60 million investments that couldn't find it in Europe. And so the challenge is not to do just public money for the sake of public money, is to put a minority stake of public money, 25%, and then have the private money coming along. So we just launched here today in Portugal, in Europe, uh, we launched this Fund of Funds for Europe. Uh, so we're going to select a general partner to uh, manage this uh, these amount of money to give the opportunity for all these companies to stay in Europe. And I think that's, uh, that's our duty, is where the market failure is, uh, as per our understanding. You, so yes, there's a big job ad, but advert out there. They can become a general general partner of a new European fund of about uh, 400 million euros, right? And we're up to a billion. Absolutely. So the, yeah, some of the criticisms of the European venture capital scene is that, say, for instance, the Jeremy funds, some of them haven't been very productive, perhaps not um, perhaps distributed or uh, executed that well. How do you react to some of that criticism? I think this is a different experience because here what we're trying to do is to do it with the private sector, with a private manager. Most of the funds that we have in Europe, they're managed uh, just with public managers, with public money. And here is a totally different ball game. It's about involving the private sector, where the private sector has a majority. And so that's for us essential uh, to have something new because what you see is that venture capital in Europe is very national. Most of the money that comes from public money wants people to invest in their own country and not to have like cross-border investments or invest in different countries in Europe at the same time. And so this is the market failure that we find and as our duty is to actually to fulfill, fulfill the gap. And, and I think it will be a big challenge, but if it works, we are actually doing something for uh, all these people. Well, um, and that's, it's great that you're on the panel because we've also got um, a share economy company on the panel as well uh, in the form of Nicholas from Blabacar. And uh, Blabacar right now is potentially reporting the Madrid authorities to the European Commission uh, 
uh, after it's been threatening blah, blah, car uh, with, and drivers for transporting passengers without a license. Now, whether or not the case has merit or not, we don't need to necessarily go into the ins and outs of it, but there is sometimes a criticism of the European Commission and EU rules that it is holding back European startups mm -hmm. and innovation in a way that doesn't happen in the States, where Uber, Lyft, et cetera, Airbnb came out of nowhere and created enormous companies and enormous markets. I mean, firstly, I mean, Jose, perhaps you want to, want to <laughs> unpack that, and then we'd like to hear what you... The, I can help. You, you think. Go ahead. <laughs> Should I start? Should you start? No, I, I mean, I, I can start and probably <laughs> will help you to, to see where's my position. On Please don't agree with each other. Uh, I, no, no, but I probably you get the wrong person on the panel because I'm the innovation commissioner. And so I'm passionate about So you're going to push things. these guys. So I'm not pushing anyone. I'm just saying that Europe cannot lose this opportunity. And the problem today is that you have politicians that are on a time lag of five years to do legislation about things that are the future that they don't know. And so you have a gap in between technology and all these guys that their lives is on a day-to-day -day inventing and innovating and politicians that take five years to legislate about something. And so when you legislate after five years, you're legislating about something that does not exist anymore because the world has changed. Well, well so you have to change that in terms of creating ways of smart regulation and regulating for the future. Uh, and that's one of the things that is one of the projects that we're working very, very hard, is to get together with people like them, sitting around the table and saying, look, what are we doing in terms of legislation? Are we doing something that will impair innovation, or are we doing something that can actually uh, uh, get us well, Nicholas, to the next you, level? Well, so th that, I mean, it sounds like you've got somebody potentially on your side here, but you know, as at this moment, there is there are still issues, aren't there? Yeah, so, so if you step back, right, for a minute on, uh, on, on this whole thing, I mean, you, we started this company 10 years ago. We've been scaling it in Europe, even outside of Europe today. We're in 22 countries. And, and the reality is because Blabacar is based on a very basic concept, which is people share their cost, you know, as their right share between cities, we had zero regulation problem in France, in Germany, in the UK, in most countries in Europe, even outside of Europe, right? So, so if, we, you know, if we put that in perspective, actually, that's the first time we have like a, a small bump on the road, in that case, it's the city of Madrid, uh, in 10 years, right? So, so I think we should, we should be careful when we say like, you know, the, the regulatory environment is very difficult. I think it depends. And for us, if I'm honest, it's actually been pretty good. It's actually been pretty easy. Uh, and whenever we go to Europe, actually, to Brussels, um, it's actually been a very good discussion. And what I discovered, I guess, over the last two years, right? I mean, I, I never thought I would talk to commissioners actually at the EU like a few years back. So it's, you? A, it's a good problem, <laughs> right? When you start talking to, uh, to regulators. But uh, you know, what's interesting is when you go to the European Commission, actually they want to listen, right? I mean, I, the thing that was striking to me is the asymmetry of information between startups and actually people doing a regulation. So if we bridge that gap, I think it's gonna go, it's gonna go in the right direction. And in our case, actually we're going to the EU to fix a, a, ch a problem in Spain, actually, right? So we're calling upon the EU to help on the uh, on, on, uh, on the member state issue, right? which is a different. Uh, do, you, do you think you're going to take a different, just quickly, just briefly? Do you think you're going to have a fairer hearing at a European level than maybe an Uber, etc., has had in terms of its hearing in the British High Courts about how it treats its workers, etc.? I, I think it's, it's a complete different case and a completely different yeah. process, so I, I think it's hard to compare, to be honest. But do you think that, the, I mean, do you think the Commission or the EU, EU authorities are more advert, you know, more, uh, shall we say, uh, sympathetic to European com companies? I don't know, actually. No, I mean, the, the, the Commission will always be fair and treat equally uh, all companies. But one of the things that we're talking here that I think is very important also for people out there is to think that there's always this negative perception of Europe that we have to fight back. And people have a negative perception until they meet Europe. They go there, they talk, and they see what's the invisible things that we're doing to get you on the same level in between the countries. It's a huge fight. It's 28 countries. You have to get them all around the table. You have to fight and discuss, and then you get to a solution. But there's this negative perception, and I'm so glad that 
everybody here knows that it's actually more of a negative perception. You know, I'm always very quick about the story that, uh, uh, that we tell uh, a lot in psychology by the halo effect that at some point in the States they did a survey to see the top 10 law schools of the US by perception. And Princeton get on the top 10. The problem is that Princeton does not have a law school. And in Europe, you know, people have this perception that is negative up right. here. We have to, to fight that. Well, as, the, as the, the token Brit on the panel, and therefore probably uh, the token negative person, I guess, <laughs> I'm going to have to ask the question, and we, don't worry, we don't have to end on this, but is Brexit going to make Farfetch move its headquarters from the UK? Uh, is Brexit going to make Booking.com more a bigger deal in Amsterdam because you'll be able to hire more easily and suddenly your workforce will all be have English accents? What do you guys think? Well, uh, Farfetch is very proudly uh, Portuguese and British. So we started from day one with, with two offices. Um, um, UK, um, obviously, is, uh, the, the London office is, is key um, to, our, to our business. And we are worried. Um, you know, it is um, it's a long-term uh, concern. And it's all about talent, to be honest. Uh, so in our, in our exact team, we have two Brits. And then we have, I think, two Americans, and then we have a bunch of European Union nationals, one New Zealander. Um, this, this is what makes London a fantastic um, city and a fantastic place to, to, um, to build startups. And if this um, old backlash against immigration, if this really um, carries through and, and actually has, has a, a material impact, do you uh, have will, will, be, um, will be adverse to the startup community for sure. Do you have any sense that uh, the, the somewhat negative atmosphere in e England right now in the UK about Brexit is it ha affecting your international workforce or any, any of them in London feeling maybe I'm going to not really. I, th I think, it, you know, in the right. aftermath of the referendum, the day after, I'm sure you remember that. It was a very depressive day in London. But I think, you know, the, the, the British um, government has always been very shrewd and savvy um, um, over centuries in dealing uh, with international affairs. So we, we count on that tradition of, uh, oh. of wisdom. Cross, and the cross fingers wisdom it. will, you know, will prevail. <laughs> Cross fingers, it, it continues to that case. Uh, do you think that uh, international European companies will uh, benefit from this kind of new environment where Europe really has to, like, punching above its weight to some extent uh, to, in order to keep the project alive? Or uh, yeah. what's your view, Gillian? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have an opinion about that. And it's more, if we think about that Europe is going to help with funding, that's great. But I think the funding, probably these startups and skills needs to hire lawyers. Because if every startup or skill needs to find out how to operate in all of these countries in Europe, that is a big job to do. And Europe has a job to make it simple. And in that sense, we need a digital single economy in Europe. And that's where I feel more steps need to be made. And, and of course, the, the Brexit was, was, was not a great thing that that happened. And for us, I mean, the UK is a very important country for us. So we will continue to support, of course, the UK. We have many Britons that are employed by booking in Amsterdam or in the UK. So that won't change for us. But I think Europe has a big job to do to make sure they make it easier for startups and scale up to become successful and to build global businesses. That's a very good point you raised about the digital single market. I mean, do, uh, do you think it's going to impact your businesses as entrepreneurs? I mean, you must be quite interested in, obviously, interested in that, in that your role. Um, you know, where is it? Where is, is it going to be delivered anytime soon? What's where is it the project at now? No, the project is going on very fast, and uh, we had here the vice president for the digital single market uh, and uh, in in the web summit, and he has been explaining every step of the way uh, what we're doing in terms of, uh, you name it, e-commerce and delivery, uh, deliver, uh, delivery of e-commerce that we've just done a, g a great step for anything related to pricing and how you deal with all the countries. But basically, it will, it will take the five years because it will take the convincing around the table of the 28 countries. But a lot was achieved. A lot was achieved already. And so we are very positive that we'll get in these Do you guys care about the digital single market or are you just 
carrying on doing your businesses? No, we, we, well, we do both. In any case, you carry on doing your business, right? But, uh, but I think we need more of Europe, right? As Gillian was saying, I mean, if you, if you need to set up like new rules, new subsidiaries, new employment contract, new everything in every market, it's just a pain. Yeah. Like, you know, we should not be doing that. We should be building the business. We should be scaling fast. So, so if you look at um, a company like BlaBlaCar, I mean, five years ago, six years ago, at the, at the beginning of the company, we said we want to be European. So it was a big thing. We hired European. We've set up offices in every market. Uh, today we are, and we're even becoming global. Um, I, I think today we need, we need more of Europe in terms of regulation, in terms of labor law. We don't need less of Europe. We need more of Europe. Uh, and that's not going to come overnight. So I don't think it's going to fix the blah, blah, car uh, issues on regulation tomorrow. But I think for the next generation of companies, it's going to be better. And for the generation after that, it's going to be better. And if you look at where we are today, do we have the talents in Europe? Yes, we do. Do we have the market size uh, in Europe combined? Yes, we do. Are we able to build uh, unicorns and big companies in Europe? Now we can, right? We didn't know that like five years ago. I mean, we, we struggled to do that five years ago. In so, uh, Gillian, I noticed you guys just did a, uh, a deal in India to, uh, with a frequent flyer program. So you're obviously looking at international markets. How, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, uh, emerging economies, uh, companies really having to get into emerging economies. You're getting into India. That's, uh, that's quite obviously a priority for you. Yeah, I mean, uh, India, but also China, uh, Japan, these are all markets that booking is investing in a lot because these are, of course, if you think about customers that are going to travel in the future, these countries will deliver a lot of tourists also coming in into European countries. Um, and Okay, and uh, just for the journalists in the front row, as I, my colleagues, they'll hate me if I don't ask this question if you, sir. At Farfetch, um, apparently there's a rumor going around that you're uh, valued at about 1.5 billion dollars. So uni unicorns coming out of Europe, and you're now looking at a flotation. Is that correct? You want to confirm or deny that rumor? So the the, the flotation piece came out on Bloomberg, and we already uh, corrected it. So it's uh, what's uh, stated is not true. So we're not gonna appoint so any bankers that. anytime soon. I think it was one of those bankers that. Jumped the gun, probably. I don't know, but it, I don't know where the source came from. But um, uh, no, no bank has been appointed, and no, no plans for 2007. Don't listen to the bankers, everyone. Right. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, it has been a pleasure to talk to you, uh, Gillian Tans from Booking.com, Jose Neves from Farfetch, Nicholas Brisson and from BlaBlaCar, and Carlos Medes from European Commission.